Bună seara, bine ați venit la meetup lunar Agile Minds Rom- România. Împreună cu colegii mei, Cristina Bogdan și Mihai, îi urăm bun venit lui Andrei, Andrei Gavrilă, care în această seară va susține o prezentare slash discuție, nu Andrei? Referitor la un subiect care cred eu e destul de controversat și în care o să discutăm de ce structura câștigă în fața proceselor și mindset-ului sau mentalității da, în rom- română. Uh, o să las pe Andrei să se prezinte singur. Andrei este un, un agilist cu experiență multă în domeniul de IT și de asemenea o să uh, rog să vă introducă în, în subiect și să seteze câteva așteptări din punct de vedere al interacțiunii. Așa că, Andrei, te rog, scena e a ta. Mulțumim frumos! Super! Mersi și eu, mersi de invitație. Mă bucur că sunt aici. Pentru mine e al doilea live cu Age Al Mind și m-am mai uitat la cel puțin un recording, dacă nu două. Um, încă o dată, mersi de, de invitație. Am venit să vă vorbesc astăzi despre un topic care se numește așa De ce structura câștigă în fața mindset-ului și al procesului? Am vorbit un pic chiar înainte să uh, începem de faptul că poate că e un topic un pic uh, controversat. Nu e un clickbait, adică chiar despre asta o să vorbesc. Uh, vreau să vă invit să interacționați cu mine, uh, să interacționați cu noi, să puneți întrebări, să puneți întrebări în timp ce povestesc. Eu m-am gândit așa, cel mai probabil o să facem o discuție de undeva la 40 de minute în care o să încerc să vă prezint ideea din spatele acestei prezentări și vom avea și două activități pe care fie că o să le facem în breakout rooms, fie o să le facem oarecum live împreună. O să vedem, o să vedem cum, cum ajungem acolo și cum vrem să le facem, cât suntem, la care sens să facem undeva la trei breakout rooms. Deși am făcut câteva miro slides, cum ziceam, aș vrea să avem mai degrabă un dialog decât să fac eu o prezentare. Deci nu ezitați, nu ezitați să întrebați. Nu cred că vom avea nevoie de foarte mult formalism, cu race hand, cu o ordine. Când aveți o întrebare, puteți, puteți să o puneți. Ziceam că vom vorbi poate în română, poate în engleză, în funcție de cine vine. Și uite, tocmai văd că intră Sasha, nu știu dacă Sasha... Uh, vorbește română sau engleză, uh, dar... O so, question, <laughs> Sasha. Sasha, are you speaking English or Romanian? Hello, Sasha. English, English. sorry. Okay, no we problem. can switch to English, no problem. I guess everybody understands English here, so... Then we will do the, the talk uh, in English and welcome. Thank you for, uh, for joining us, Sasha and um, Egor. Um, I was just saying that I, I plan to do a presentation for maybe 30, 40, 50 minutes. We will see how we go. We will see how we will be discussing. Everybody's invited to contribute. I don't want to do a talk. Um, and um, I will also have a slot for questions at the end. I think Bogdan shared with you a Miro board. These will be the things that I plan to use as a, um, as a small uh, structure for um, for my talk. Um, with that, I think the first part, which is about organization, it's over. I'm not sure if I'm forgetting something, Florine. Um, uh, if you like to share the screen, maybe with the mirror board. Sure. Maybe, maybe some people could not. Uh... Sure. Uh, let me share the screen. It's good. We can see it, uh, Andre. Okay, good. Yeah. So this will be our agenda for today. Uh, why structure wins over process and mindset? What's the idea with mindset process with structure? How do most of agile initiatives look in terms of focus on structure, process, and culture? Uh, how and why structure wins? Uh, a simple tool for creating structure in any context and Q&A. So that's, that's what I'm planning to do. As you can see, 
Um, it's not going to be a lot of stuff here. This is just an overview of everything that we will uh, be doing. I also want to tell you that, in my opinion, uh, when I talk about different subjects, I aim to have this ratio to give you all, to give us all, because I'm also here to learn from everybody. Um, um, some answers, but I would also want us to leave with some questions because when we leave with questions, that means we will investigate, we will look to understand more, we will try to figure things out uh, on our own. And I do hope that at the end of this session, you will have around, I don't know, five answers, 10 answers, whatever, and twice as much questions. And at the end, you will also have my LinkedIn if you would like uh, to debate more with me uh, what and how and your opinion about sub the subject, don't hesitate. A couple of words about me. My name is Andrei Gavrile and I live in Brasov. Actually, now I'm in vacation. I'm not in Brasov, but uh, I, uh, I am from Brasov and I have uh, 18 years of experience in building products for millions of users. So mostly, oh, mostly all my career was in, is in software development, so around 18 years. I worked for and with small companies, startups, up to the biggest enterprises of the world, uh, with a lot of employees, more than, I, I, don't, I think now it's actually more than 500K, uh, one of the companies that I worked for. Um, and one of the things that I think sets me in a way apart uh, and makes my experience and what I'm going to tell you here interesting is that I was always in, in a sort of dual mode of working. So almost half of these 18 years, I worked as an individual contributor, as a software developer, as a technical lead, uh, as a software architect, and the other half uh, in leadership role. So something like a delivery manager or agile coach or uh, CTO. Uh, the same half of these years, I worked for product companies. Probably, as you know, in product companies, we will be focusing on one market, on some user segments, and we will be getting very, very in-depth to understand the dynamic, everything that's happening there. The other nine, I worked in outsourcing companies or service companies where I got the chance to work with a lot of companies, less in-depth because I worked with more, but I also got the chance to see when we win, if there is something that is common or more interestingly, when we miss and we lose and we learn, again, if there is something that is common in all of these things. So I think the, this talk uh, rests on, on, on that experience on my 18 years. Um, and also in the past two years, I've been focusing a lot on consulting audits and due diligence. Uh, and again, I got the chance to have overviews of, of companies, uh, less in-depth, but interesting, interesting perspectives. Uh, I'm also, um, um, I've listed some of the roles there. Today, I'm a technical director for Globant, um, but my roles, the roles uh, that represent me in a way are CTO, technical advisor, agile coach, and mentor. This is how I would define the roles that are closest to my uh, heart. Uh, and agile coaching uh, is uh, uh, something that uh, I enjoy doing. I'm doing less and less now, uh, but the idea is that I am using the things that I've learned in the roles that I'm having today as a CTO and technical advisor. Now, I also would like to know a couple of things about you. I want to, um, in a sense, calibrate the uh, talk to you and I tested the reactions. I think you can also use the reactions here in Zoom. It would be interesting to know um, how many of you are in a Nagel coach, Scrum master, or let's say similar role uh, today. And if you are, can you use the reaction and just do a thumbs up here? So I see around... Okay, I see around eight people. Also, how many of you are in uh, working in an agile context? So being part of an agile team, supporting an agile team, working in a company with agile teams, the same thing. If you can do a thumbs up just to have an idea here.
Okay. So around half of us, maybe some of us are not at the PC, no worries. Um, and my last question for you here is, I don't think this is recording, but how many of you, the, the ones that raised uh, the hand, uh, are happy with the AGL, your AGL context? How many of you would say, yes, it works, it's good, I'm happy, it's fine, the same, thumbs up, please. So, so, okay. So only two, uh, two thumbs ups from what I saw. And I think that's around 20 to 25%. By the way, I'm only uh, having one screen. I'm playing with Zoom a little bit. You're just seeing my screen, right? And yes, yeah. we can we can see your screen, uh, Andre, and also we monitor the chat. So no worries. If there's a question or something, we're going to raise it. Okay. Now, here is the first uh, activity that we will be doing together. Um, this first activity is about defining Agile. Um, and I'm going to ask um, our admins to split us into breakout rooms. And you see, we have three teams here in the eyes of an Agile coach, in the eyes of a developer, in the eyes of, of an executive. Here, I, I'm going to ask you, the teams, to define what agility is, but not how you understand it, but how you feel people in these roles understand it. So for example, if I would be in team two, I would try to imagine how a developer or any individual contributor, part of an agile team would define agility. And I'm not going to try to make it too fancy. I'm just going to write a couple of things here. So maybe the developer is going to send, say something like, okay, for me, agility is uh, uh, doing uh, work in iterations and uh, I don't uh, getting annoyed by the definition of ready or whatever. I mean, we're not looking for anything fancy. We're just looking for a short conversation about how we feel that as a group, these roles will be defining Asia. And this is directly linked to our talk because you will see how these definition link to the three pillars of our discussion, culture, process, and structure. So is it clear? You also have here a short instruction of what we are going to do. Feel free to use any LLM, highly encouraged, especially if you, I don't know, find yourself into a team that has no idea what an agile coach would think, just feel free to use an LLM. The idea would be just to see how we think that these roles define Agile and agility. Any questions? Not on the chat. Uh, how many minutes uh, to be the breakout rooms? I think Maybe. it will be short, but I would say no more than five, six minutes. The idea is okay. just to have a short conversation to try to put ourselves in the shoes of these roles. And then we will see how things go. Is that fine? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so nobody has any other questions. I guess we can uh, we can break the rooms. Yeah, and by the way, if you can, Florine, Bogdan, uh, maybe we can go each of us in another in one of the rooms, and we can uh, help if if needed. Yeah. Sure. We will need to manually move inside the rooms uh, because I automatically distributed the participants. So as co-hosts, we will need to manually choose. So uh, yeah, no okay. worries. I, I will go in the, the room three in this case. Okay. I'll go in room two. Okay, let's wait for the other people to come back. I think everybody's back, right? That's correct. Okay. It was six minutes, by the way. I gave five and plus one uh, yeah, as yeah, uh, the extra good. one, as Andre mentioned. So well, that's good. So let's take a look on, on what we discussed. So just as a reminder, we focused on how we feel that these roles would define agility per se. So let's go to team one and tell us quickly what you've discussed and what's the idea here, please.
So I like this right. one, whatever works. <laughs> mm -hmm. But someone was agile coach in the room one. Maybe. Yeah, I will. Uh, I, I will uh, yeah, continue. Mihaela. Yeah, for me. Uh, hi, everyone. So for me, uh, from my uh, lens as an agile coach, what I'm looking for uh, lately is about culture. So it's kind of beyond processes, beyond ma mindset and start looking at culture and uh, how all these things are, co are, connect are connected, are interconnected. So it's mindset plus relationships, plus behaviors, plus all these things that and it's about the team culture and also the organizational culture. So this is for me what uh what is agile from from an agile coach perspective. Just really really short. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we will keep it that short. Just to do a short tour and and then we'll continue. So I see there are also two um two posted that say an agile coach will probably say something around continuous learning. That's what agility is, context in which we learn, in which we grow, in which we get better. But also a very interesting, pragmatic uh, sticky note that says whatever works. Okay, so just let's make things work. Pretty interesting. Maybe just a comment here on whatever works, if if you guys want to add something on, on this. What? Yeah, I have one. I think someone spelled wrong adaptation. For me, that's whatever works in this business context nowadays. Okay, thank you. Let's go to team two. So the here we said what agility is through the eyes of an individual contributor, a developer in the Scrum sense, right? Any member of, a, of an agile team uh, or an, an individual contributor. So let's see here. What, what did you guys discuss in room two? I don't know if somebody wants to share from, from our room. I volunteer Bogdan. <laughs> Okay, so you volunteer Bogdan, come on Bogdan, or you volunteer me? My... <laughs> I volunteer yourself, Bogdan. <laughs> okay, okay, then I can wrap it up. Thank you, Vlad. So we took the context of basically a developer joining an Agile team with zero knowledge about Agile. So that's that was the framework, uh, that was the context. And uh, basically, uh, a good way of putting it is, well, I think the developer had some knowledge about Agile because the answer is very, very good. <laughs> Yeah. Creating a context without interruption where you're allowed to maximize the value of your work. Um, that's the happiest path. That's the ideal path of, uh, of the Agile environment. Okay. Agile for me, it's an environment where tackli uh, tackling risks as early as possible in an iterative approach. Again, somebody read about Agile before. So the context that was initially presented wasn't quite respected, but we, we liked it. And also we enjoy the predictability aspect that the developer would think about recurrent events, consistent and clear goal of the events. So basically thinking about trying to predict the unpredictable. This was a quote uh, shared by Vlad. So I thought it's, it's well worth to, to capture it there. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's do uh, the last line. So how do you think an executive company owner up and management would define agility? How do they see agility in I would speak about my uh, my contribution very quickly. I put in buzzword uh, because I do believe uh, agility tends to be like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everybody thinks everybody else is doing it. So everybody actually claims uh, they have it. And I'll leave my colleagues for uh, the rest of the ideas that they, uh, they supported. Thank you. I added a sticky note regarding the, the faster delivery. Usually, executives see Agile as a way of getting things done quicker and faster delivered to production and released. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, I'll be next. So I um, proposed and we added some uh keywords on innovation uh, customer centricity faster time to market and return on, on investment as uh, some of them uh, are really focusing on uh, getting some uh, real value and uh, uh, evaluate those results so we have the level where is okr are important so uh, most uh, first of all, we're gonna focus on the most important uh, 
uh, result and focusing on customer because we want to get more value of collaboration with them and uh, getting the uh, feedback and also faster time to market because on uh, L3, L4 level of management, they do uh, really care about uh, having uh, a faster delivery and faster time to market. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So thank you everyone um, for this. Um, now we did this exercise because it's something that I also do. Um, as an agile coach, I saw that every time that I'm speaking with different people, especially different roles, we speak about different stuff when we speak about agility. Um, and there are two ways to define anything. I mean, there are two ways to define what something is. One, which is an authority-based definition, like you go to a dictionary or you go to a, to a, a body of knowledge that will tell you agility is, I don't know, a mindset or agility is something. Um, and the other way to define something is through common understanding, which is you go and you sample a population. You go and you ask people in a population, what is agility to you? And actually to me, um, because agile is such a buzzword, it's such an overloaded word. So we discussed about that, but also overloaded word, which means it means different thing to everybody. I do like to, to do this exercise with a lot of roles and ask them, what do you think agility is? And here is something interesting. I usually ask through the nature of my work, uh, agile coaches, scrum masters, maybe product owners, so people that in general are responsible for introducing or supporting agility in the company, what agility is to them. Then I'm asking team members, people that are part of teams doing the work, what agility is to them. And then I'm asking executives, BB directors, uh, product managers, uh, more than just, in my opinion, not team POs, or we can discuss a little bit about that, but let's say on a more executive level, a product manager on a more executive level, the agility is to them. And here is what people tell me. These are approximations, but I have I have uh, some, some numbers. When I speak with agile coaches and scrum master, around 55% of them will tell me something around the mindset. So the way that we approach things, they will tell me about uh, iteration, they will tell me about collaboration, they will tell me about uh, managing risk, a little bit what we discussed here continuous learning, culture, focus on transformation and collaboration. 30% of them are going to tell me something related to a way of working. Again, they will not mention mindset, but they will say something like iterative way of working, uh, a sense of having a control over risk, etc. So if you want these two are quite close one to another. And 8% of them or 10% of them will tell me something around frameworks. So will tell me like, ah, is the fact that we are working in Scrum or safe and this allows us to deliver or something, something. Now, when I speak to team members, so developers, UI, UX, QA, uh, people that are part of the team, actually 80% of time, they tell me something that's related to a method, a methodology or a process. So they will say to me, agility is we meet and we do sprints. And at the end of the sprint, we deliver a package. And at the beginning of the sprint, we do a planning and we have a definition of ready, definition of done and we respect and the requirements are coming, etc. This is why um, I, I feel that people are closer to this sticky that we have here. Some of them speak speak this kind of language, but in my experience, around 15 to 20% of developers, most of them would say something around this, which is good. I mean, we are not judging what people say, it's just to have an idea. And what's interesting is when I speak with executives, they will actually tell me a lot of things around capabilities. So they, when, when they tell me what agility is to them, they would say it's a tool, it's a something that I can put in the service of my business to go faster, to have more innovation, to have more return on investment, something that was also discussed in the team three uh, breakout room. So a lot of them, they would see agility as a capability, like an attribute, like, like a possibility that the company has with that, which is quite interesting because as you see, agile coaches and team members never speak about the capability, never speak about that. Like it's a capability that allows in a sense um, the, 
company to go faster. Now, these are my results. I'm not saying that they extend to everything. I'm not saying that they are perfect, but I wanted to share this view with you because um, I do think it's pretty interesting. Yes, somebody has a question, I think. No, it was just, just a noise in, in that case. So again, for executive, 30% of them would, would talk to me about Scrum, about installing Scrum in all their teams and doing that and synchronizing work and, and all of those things. 50% of them would, would talk to me about practices like CICD or things that uh, their company should have. Now, why am I telling you uh, all, all of these things? Twofold, because this is how companies, roles, members, individuals think of agility. And this will help us a lot into our discussion about process mindset and structure. Um, and um, I do think that it, it, it is through how we see agility, we also measure it and adapt. What do I mean by that? Is that when executives will say, well, whatever, this agility is not working for me, most of them will think about that, about the capability. They would say, in the end, my company is not faster, is not delivering more results, is not more innovative, the things that we discussed in on number three. When team members would say the agility is not working for me, they would mean that the PO is not bringing requirements that are respecting definition of ready, that there is some pressure from management to deliver faster uh, without respecting their way of working. Uh, so process orientation in a sense. Uh, and when agile coaches would say, Agility is not working in this company. They would say the culture is not there. People do not behave as they should. We are not respecting the values and all of these things. And again, this ties into the three things that we said that we will be discussing today. And I think you kind of saw them. You kind of saw them in here. So um, I've been working in transformation and supporting agile journeys. I actually like more of this. Uh, wording, supporting agile journeys rather than transformation, because transformation feels like we start and we end somewhere. Agile journey is just a journey. It will, it's never ending in a way. But I've been working, uh, supporting uh, agile journeys and transformation for probably 10 years now. And again, when we speak about how companies are doing transformation, they are going into three major ways. One, which is Actually, all of them you will see have some mix, but one which is mostly culture or mindset focused. Another one which is mostly practices or process focused. And another one which is governance and structure focused. And this is the, let's say the part where we clearly identify what the difference between these three parts are. So now let me tell you a little bit about that. But first, does this speak to you? Would you agree that most transformation will take a mix of these three things, but with a focus on one or maybe two? Totally agree. For me, it would be culture and mindset and practices and processes for my company where I work. It's a yeah. mix of two. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. Anybody else? In general, Andre, I I saw that many companies are focusing on the practices and processes rather than the culture and mindset. To be honest, uh, and the previous exercise was really interesting because made me think about having a common language about what agile means for company, an organization, and different people from there. Because if you don't have a common language, then probably, as I'm experiencing right now in, uh, in the endeavor that I, I'm, I'm uh, working on, so there is a disconnect between what someone who wants to mean <laughs> when are discussing about some topics, you know. So you are saying some buzzwords and anyone and everybody understands something else. Yeah. Actually, that's what's happening most of the time. 
Uh, and that's why when people say Agile is broken, my favorite question is, what part of it? Well, how how do you feel it is broken? Because it's that's not written really adding uh, enough information to me to to understand where where we are. And to me, this is really insightful because yeah, I, I think it proves, and I do suggest that you you look at that. It proves that we are speaking different languages. We look at things differently, and there is no way that we can row in the same direction if we understand things differently. If we look at them um, in a sense differently, so. Coming back to this, the three ways that you can approach an agile transformation, or as I said, as I prefer it, an agile journey is... Uh, may I add something on transformation? Please. Uh, so uh, what I observed that uh, most of the um, transformations are focusing, you know, some consulting stuff, when, when they're doing it, they are focusing on practices and processes for sure. And then structure like organizational uh, or organograms or structure. Mm -hmm. And they underestimate culture and mindset. And as a result, they are trying to uh, engage more uh, agile coaches to uh, resolve uh, it, th this issue. That's a, ve that's a very good point. Um, thank you. I will I will speak a little bit on, on that um, later because we actually need all three of them. The question is, yeah. where do we start? What what makes the most sense, and how can the, these three support each other? And what you're saying, Igor, is that you you saw compared to um, um, what we said previously, actually a focus on these two things, and not enough focus here, and then. Things are not working out as as expected. That's that's a that's a good point. We will be coming back to this. So, I said the transformation do approach. I mean, transformation look at least at two of these three uh, dimensions. Um, but the one that will start with mindset will be focusing a lot on this changing hearts and minds, being agile rather than doing agile. Focus on values and principles and me as an agile coach for a long time that was my angle that was the way that i was addressing agile transformations because yeah it speaks to me and it speaks to me like it speaks to the group that we have here that's the way that i perceived agility and therefore that's the way that i was addressing agility. just that just by doing that i wasn't necessarily winning a lot of times because I was neglecting how others see agility. But that's how we approach it in terms of agile as a mindset. That's how we will approach the transformation. So the thing that will happen is we will do maybe trainings. We will be bringing coaches that will be looking on how to support the right behaviors. We will be um, supporting teams, telling them why, I don't know, customer collaboration is super important customer proximity, working together as a team, having a, an always, in a, in a sense, a positive outlook, stopping and inspecting and adapting and doing all of this stuff. That's good. Just that it's super hard to do. It's not something that you can change after a three weeks, three months, six months, nine month program. This would be fantastic in a sense if it would work. That would be like the best solution. And we would not be having this conversation now in 2024, uh, 23 years after the manifesto was signed. So if this would have been the right path and if this would have worked, we would have probably be speaking about something else today because agility it would have been solved, over, done. We all know how to do it. We are all doing it well. So the problem with Agile as a mindset is that it's super important. Not everybody gets it. Actually, in my opinion, very few people get it. And when this kind of transformation failed, they failed as a, it seems like a theoretical approach that people cannot actually put it in practice. And a lot of time I've heard, not not, not to me, but in a lot of contests, I heard 
Ah, that, that's just theory. It doesn't work here. We cannot do it like this. It's important to collaborate with a customer, but I've never seen a customer and that's how we do stuff here. We have five layers of discussion with customers and I just get requirements and I do them and that's it and that's done and no point to look here. That's in a sense, the problem with Agile as a mindset. I like it, I support it, but in my opinion, it doesn't work, especially because of that. It's hard, not everybody gets it. Not everybody wants to get it. Not everybody wants to have a, a, a spiritual transformation, understanding agile values and ways of work and all of that. It's sad, but that's the truth. I will take questions if you want on the end of these three slides because they come together. And I think it will make more sense if, if you will be having some. Now, companies that approach agile as a process, which in my opinion is most companies, they will focus a lot on how to do things, on practices, on role, on events, on artifacts. They will be installing Scrum. They will be installing Safe or less. They will be measuring their transformation by saying, how many teams did we agilize? How do they follow this agilization? Is how, how many teams are uh, did the Scrum training? How many teams are following the process? And all of these things. They will be creating dashboards. This is how many teams have definition of ready. This is how many teams have definition of done, et cetera, et cetera. This is how velocities, trends are happening and all of that. Now, agile as a process is actually much easier. And this is why consultancy would be coming and doing that because it's very tangible and you would be able to say, yes, all of these teams are doing Scrum and that's fantastic. And now we are doing Scrum, but the problem is when it fails, it fails because it becomes something that in the industry we call a cargo cult, which is we are mimicking something. We are going through all the emo uh, flow, through all the motion, but with no results. So things that happen are people are saying, of course, we are doing a sprint retrospective. Nobody comes and we started to uh, send a PowerPoint or we say, of course, we are doing sprint retrospective. Nobody comes, but we are still doing a demo uh, of the what was implemented to uh, the entire team or something like that. And that's what's going through the motion, but not necessarily having the benefits. Is. And now the, the third part, which is Agile is a structure it's actually focused on something that is defining and respecting rules. So Egor told us something about the fact that the organization is a type of structure. But that's not the only type of structure. We will be seeing a bit later definition of, 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 of structure and we will be doing an exercise. But the idea here in Agile as a structure is that structure means defining and respecting rules creating a context or a foundation for teams to succeed. And here is how some of these rules look like. Saying, I want, instead of saying, I want all my teams to be Scrum, to be following Scrum, to be training Scrum, I, I would rather focus on the better rule, so to say, in Scrum, which is that I want all my teams to be cross-functional teams. I want all my teams to have backlogs that have the right attributes rather than saying all the teams are doing Scrum, saying, no, that's important, but not the most important. I want to be measure something else. So in a sense, I can extract from the mindset and from the process, a set of rules that I want my context to respect. And I can list this kind of rules. And to me, that's another form of structure where the way that I approach transformation is not necessarily based on installing a process, is not based on installing a mindset, which would be great, but doesn't work, but it's actually based on understanding how many of my contexts are respecting a set of rules that are appropriate for me. And that's the kind of structure that I want to create and that in general, when I work in Agile journeys, I create. And these, as I said, are just example of rules. Do I have all the team cross-functional teams? Are all teams trending impediments down in a sense? So they are having less and less impediments as the time go by. I don't care if they do perfect scrum, but I care if the, their list of impediments is well kept and that trend is going down. That, in my opinion, is what I call in, in the scope of this presentation and in general, the structural approach. You might be having questions because 
there there are some there is some confusion around some of the things here, but we also have a, an exercise letter to understand what that is. So now, as we discussed in my experience, the industry approaches an agile transformation like that. Huge focus on practices, some focus on culture, but the idea that culture will be coming three years from now, and a little bit of focus on structure, which might be usually what you said, Igor. Let's just restructure a little bit the org, but that's it, in a sense. Now, my take, and it's not just my take, because in a sense, I'm speaking in the name of a group of peers, of colleagues with whom um, I've discussed this many, many times, is that the transformation, the agile journey that work look like that. They focus a lot on structure. And that structure is actually what will allow the culture and practices to emerge. And in a sense, to work. So now, we will be looking now for a tool of structure and we will be doing an exercise. But let's see if there are some questions here, please. I have one question, Andre. Um, Agile as a structure for me looks like the prerequisites for high performance teams, like clear roles and responsibilities, clear goals, cross functional ability to deliver done stuff each iteration. Uh, if you are thinking about the Shuhari process that Alistair Cockburn mentioned years ago, do you think the Shuhari approach could work in this kind of journey of agile transformation, let's say, for the companies? I mean, which will be Shu, which will be Ha, which will be Re from those three mindset, process, and structure? Hmm. It's interesting. I, I don't think I have um, the, uh, let's say, the right answer to this because it's not, Shuhari seems more like a progression um, in which you start somewhere and you transform to something better and then you, you go to a state where you kind of break the rules, you are the rules, you are the master of the things. In my opinion, the three of them are not necessarily to be seen as, as steps. Let's start with process and let's go to structure and let's go to mindset. But they are things that should always coexist. And there should always be like a number one, the thing that we always look at. And I think in Shu or in Ha or in Ri, you should always be looking at structure, but that your structure will be changing because you need a smaller structure to be in Shu, so at the beginning, to be able to do things, and you need a much larger structure to be uh, in, in phases of mastery, in Re, let's say, because that will be supporting your thing. But it doesn't mean that you will be always working on the structure. You just need better structure so that you can run faster, so that you can accelerate, so that you can have the velocity that you want. And that's like, the, the thing that should support you. So in Shu, you will need a smaller structure. It doesn't have to be perfect. You will be maybe walking with a smaller bike. In Ha, you need a better structure. You have a motorcycle. You need, let's say, something that is like a, a road. And in Ri, you will be needing those levitating train, magnetic stuff to be able to go with 400 kilometers per hour. In my opinion, it's more like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. We have to raise hands, Bogdan and Christina. <laughs> yeah, I like the I like the question, uh, uh, Florin, um, about the shuhari because I was thinking about the same. My question is though, if we are saying that structure is the foundation, how can you make sure you define a good structure mm -hmm. if you don't think about a process or if you don't have the right product centric mindset to build the foundation of the structure? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So probably that some the first, let's say the first part of the structure should be around that. If that is to you the number one concern, that's where that's how you will norm your structure to be. So you'd say, for me, unless we have product centricity or user centricity, there can't be anything. And that could be in your case, Bogdan, and could not be maybe in the case of uh, Andrea. 
or not in my case, in the case of my teams, because the fact is there is no structure as in just take the structure. There is this idea that I should be focusing on the structure, but then I need different structure for different contexts. So if you would say to me, what is the most important now is to have that in my structure, you'll have to figure out a way to say, this is mandatory. We will be measuring it like that. This is how it looks like when it's in a sense done. And then you will be saying all the teams in all my company will be following this structure. They all need to follow these rules. And then you will be working on the rules rather than working on, let's say, installing Scrum or speaking with people about the, let's say, the mindset change uh, that should happen. Okay. Thank you for the answer, Andre. Christina? Yeah, so I don't have a specific question, just wanted to share my understanding with what Andre just presented to us. Uh, and I would like your opinion on this, Andre. The way I see it is focused on the problem. Focus on the problems that we have now as a team and where do we want to get uh, in terms of uh, performance? What are the most important issues that are uh, keeping us back? And try to build something from that rather than decide as an organization or as a group or as a team that we need a new process or a need, need to change the culture. That's usually That usually comes in iterations after we address a vision, we have a vision, we have a goal in mind, we have something to aim for, and we address many other issues that we have as a group um, and that in the end will generate a new culture and a new process. That's the way I'm uh, reading into this. Yes, and you start with that, you start with your vision and you start with your problems and you start with the opportunities. Yeah. And then in a sense, you go to this point, you ask yourself, what capabilities, what structure do I need to build yeah. so that I can achieve my vision, so mm -hmm. that I can overcome my problems? And then you will have to use some tools and we will be looking at the tool quickly to say, this is what I need. And maybe you would be saying, I don't know, because we have so many impediments and that's the, the thing that is slowing this company down the most, impediments and dependencies. I need to figure out the structure, not the process, a structure that will gradually reduce my impediments that will gradually reduce my dependencies. Now, for a lot of people that could be safe, but no, <laughs> safe is still a process and it will still act yeah. as a process. It will tell you do that and do that and do that, but it will not be directly connected to your type of dependency. It will not be directly connected to your impediments. And maybe here is the, the thing is, when I go and I see companies that are slowed down by their dependencies, I say, we need a structure that will focus on reducing impediments and dependencies. And then we say, this structure should probably be three type, a role that will always look at dependencies and um, um, impediments. And then I go ask who here can solve problems because Scrum says the Scrum master should be solving impediments and dependencies. But that's not always the case because your dependency and impediments could be on a much higher level than what the Scrum master could do. And then I say, you know what our process says that the Scrum Master should be doing that? No. Here, the Scrum Master will not be solving imped impediments, but we will make all the team managers directly responsible for reducing the trend of impediments or whatever. It could be executives if these people don't have the power and authority to make them, to reduce them. Now, this is in a sense the difference between what a process would say, says, every time a Scrum Master should be working on that, rather than saying, what kind of structure do I need to create? And Scrum, in my opinion, will norm, norm will create rules that are not necessarily context aware. And multiple times I've seen in large companies that the Scrum Master is not able to resolve impediments because they don't have the ear of the actually decision makers. And then you put in place a process not a structure that can actually solve problems and then you fail. 
Okay, we have two more uh, raise hands, Egor and Mihaela. Let's uh, let's take those questions also, and after that, uh, let's see the tool for the structure. Egor, please raise first. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to continue about structure and my like understanding. If we're talking about rules, it could be also kind of practices like uh, team norms, time boxing, and just want to clarify if I, I get the right understanding of structure. Um, you can create a rule that says all the teams should have team norms. And if you create it like that and you put it as part of your structure, of the requirement of your system, that's good. That's a that's a rule. You're not going to tell how they are going to implement it or or why. But in my opinion, a lot of us create that rule just because we have to do it, <laughs> and uh -huh. we just put it in place. And that's how, in my opinion, it becomes nothing something that's not necessarily useful, but done more in a religious way, in a religious sense. First, I'm not saying that teen norms are not a good thing. I've seen a lot of contexts where they are a great thing, but not always. They shouldn't be always the solution and they shouldn't always be the focus. But in general, we kind of put the same solution in all places. So, um, and I, I think that's wrong. And I think that's what processes are uh, in which you say, I'm going to install Scrum. And as part of my installation of Scrum, I'm going to install team norms and processes. And as part of my sprint, retrospective, I'm going to start creating sprint processes and rules, and I'm going to add them to that. But maybe this is not necessarily needed in a sense. And I would only put it if I have something in a sense structural, let's say I'm working in a company where I see that because of the lack of the team norms, all the teams have a certain problem. And I'm going to say we need this kind of structure or a part of teams and, and all of that. Time boxing is um, I would say a, a good practice, but I wouldn't call that a structure. Um, in a sense, I see time boxing more in the zone of process slash practice. We need it, but again, it's not, in my opinion, something that goes into a into a kind of rule. Um, one thing that is interesting here is that I while I when I tell people about this and about the structure. One of the first things that they start with is norming their Scrum. <laughs> and they say, you will see there are some columns and they say in the first column, we will be starting to do planning and sprint reviews and uh, retros. In the second column, we will be looking at flow metrics. In the third column, we will be, and you can put a structure around Scrum, but in my opinion, if you put a structure around process, it's still process, process. orientation in a sense. Uh, better than saying, okay, do we time box or not the things, um, you should be asking, are my teams spending too much time in different events? And if my teams are constantly spending time in different events, they probably need a rule. And that rule might be, we need a product owner that can really help us understand our requirements. Or... We need to be focusing on reducing our technical debt because we always, always, always speak about technical debt and that's problematic. And that that's the kind of rule maybe that that becomes somehow the kind of structure that you want to put in place rather than that. But I'm a big fan of time box. I'm not having anything against them. It's sort of less of a capability to be promoted, in my opinion, to something around structure. Uh, Mihaela, do you mind if we take your uh, um, question just after I show this tool? Yeah, sure, because I was having three questions anyway, so I have to decide <laughs> which one to, okay. to ask. Yeah, sure. Because I will show you the tool. I would ask you to tell me how you want us to proceed, because there are two ways so that we also do this. And we are close to the end, so we are... Uh, we still have 20 minutes or so, uh, but I would like to go through this so that you, you see the point. So what do we see here? Um, there are multiple tools to create structure. Uh, I'm going to show you one, which is called the maturity model. Um, maturity models have a bad reputation in the industry, especially due to CMMI that focused a lot on auditing, 
in my opinion, a maturity model is a great tool if you know where to use it and how to use it and can become as anything else, just like Scrum or Safe, something uh, horrible if you misuse it or put it in the wrong context. Now, here is a maturity tool that is coming from a, a company that I'm, I'm working at, uh, Pentalog, in which I don't want you to necessarily look on all of these things and say, oh, that's good or that's not good, because this is custom build. The tool that I'm showing you is the maturity model, not the lines in the maturity model. And we said, we sit around the table in a certain context and we said, if we are to do product ownership right, what kind of rules do we want to respect? And that's what created this tool, which is my opinion, which actually will tell us the kind of structure that we want to create, which is the tool that I said that I will present this maturity model. And you see here, we've transformed all of the items into two, four columns. One that's called starter, almost good, good, and very good. Uh, now, this is actually about, oh, that's to be, it's actually, the starter is actually about risk reduction. These two are about efficiency. Efficiency. And this, are about, let's say, innovation or let's say competitive advantage. Competitive advantage. And we said, so from a product ownership point of view, what are the items that we need to check, we need to do the structure that we want to have to say, once done, we are no longer in an immediate risk of failure. And in this context for this team, we said, we want to have an explicit vision, we want to estimate. I don't know why to put estimate here or on the left or on the right. That's what this team, in a sense, decided. That to them, if they don't estimate, they are in a sense of risk. Uh, they want to have enough backlog visibility. They want to be doing feature mapping. They want to prioritize feature, etc. In order to be efficient, they said we want to be having stakeholder engagement. We want to be looking at metrics and KPIs. We want to be doing shareholder management, etc. And if we would eventually want to have a competitive advantage, we will need to have this kind of stuff happening in a sense or other. So you see, we are not speaking about what the product owner should do. We are not looking at Scrum, but we are saying to pro for product ownership to be done well, what are the kind of rules that we want to respect? And this is the tool. This is the tool that in my opinion creates the underlying discussion about structure. Because then you would be saying, we don't have an explicit vision. And then you would say, we said that for us, this is critical. This is something that reduces the risk of failure. What do we need to have in order to build that? And then the conversation starts, the role can evolve, et cetera. I wanted to show you this, but I also want to um, propose that we do this exercise. And because this tool about structure it's not just about Ajax, it can be about anything else. And here is one thing that I find super interesting. The first value in the Ajax manifesto is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And when I go and I speak with teams and I say, what do you have in place so that your teams are happy and motivated, which to me is directly linked to the individual and interaction. A lot of companies say, um, you know, we do some uh, survey engagement from time to time to measure the engagement. Um, we do give the right laptops and we do team building and we try to look at that. So definitely it's something that is not necessarily there thought of implementing existing. The structure is not just about agility. The structure is about everything. And in my opinion, when you work with people, and we all work with people, the first question that you should ask is, what kind of structure, what kind of rules do I want to have in my department or in my team so that the people in the teams are happy? And that's one of the things that I look at, and I think that's super important point to look at, rather than asking, did we install Scrum? Or are we thinking in an iterative way? I think this is, in a sense, a precursor. And if you don't have the right structure to support people engagement or to support people skills, you are starting too far in the transformation journey. 
So we will not be splitting into the teams, but I do want you to, um, to think, so we will be doing this exercise now together in the next um, couple of minutes, maybe four minutes. And I do want you to, to think if you will be feeling a maturity model on people engagement, you can call it motivation, happiness at work, whatever you want. In, one, in the teams that you have now, what are the rules that you would like your company, you, to respect so that you're no longer in a risk of failure, immediate failure? When we speak about people engagement, what does failure mean? Disengagement. Disengagement? What else? Turnover rate. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Then what are the rules that we should all respect so that there is not a lot of waste? So here you can think of stuff that are demotivating some of the teams, some of the people in your teams. And then oh, what, mm -hmm. what are, sorry? Go on. And then what are the rules? What are the capabilities that we want to build? So that in our company, in our context, people would say we are better than most of the industry. In terms of people engagement, we do the things that are really better than everybody else. So, so breakout take... rooms or no, we will stay here. Business. Let's take three minutes and let's all of us put one sticky or two stickies in any column that we want. And then we will be creating a structure for people engagement. And then we will be wrapping it up with the questions. Okay, we will be stopping soon in 30 seconds.
Thank you. Good work. Um, I've been reading them while you were typing, and I just want to speak about a couple of things here. Certain context, this can be here or here, but the discussion is already good. We don't really care, will not be very dogmatic of where things are. And here is a rule that I like and um, I, I, I identify with, identify and isolate text toxic behaviors. They are all good, but think of how many companies they speak about that, but they don't necessarily do it. They don't necessarily look at it. They don't necessarily measure it. They don't necessarily think about that. And they don't say, did we build all we need, all the capabilities we need to identify and isolate text toxic behavior? Because this would mean training people, mm -hmm. making somebody responsible, explaining what toxic behavior is and not. But these are always, you see, capabilities and stuff and structure that is left somehow behind. And then there are scrum masters that I know that are very careful here and they are very skilled in doing that. And then they are there are managers that don't know what to do about that. And then there are executives that maybe encourage the toxic behavior or or have programs to reduce toxic behavior. But it seems very, in a sense, ad hoc, not necessarily as a foundation that something happens. And this is what structure is all about, is creating the foundation for things to to happen. The same, support healthy feedback and recognition. This would be very different from team to team. Some teams want better feed, let's say more often, feedback often. Some Somebody want feedback, let's say every three weeks, three months, three one day. We don't say here how it should be done, but we would be asking the teams if they accept this rule and if they have it, do you have enough of this rule? And not as part of engagement surveys that happen every six or 12 months, but as part of regular follow-up on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis, or things like that. Um, and um, again, this, this could be items here. So what, what did we do together? We said we've created a maturity model on people engagement, saying these are the kind of rules that we want to respect so that we are not in an immediate risk of failure, an embarrassing immediate risk of failure. This is what we should do to improve efficiency of on, on the people engagement area better understand what we want. And this is what would be the best of the best. This one, when I do this exercise with executives, with team, always pops up here in the right column, where they say, we do have reward system here, but it feels like it's not, they're not tailored for me. I'm more interested in a, I don't know, in, in, a, in a better medical assurance, or I'm more interested in having a, half of the vacation paid and somebody is interested on some, something different. So if you, for example, really want to be here, to be able to say that in my context, we are the best of the best, these kind of things will be the ones that we have here or use EBM or being open to ideas and change process and all of these things. Somebody put the um, Q12 from Gallup. Um, I think it's super interesting. I do suggest that you take a look on it uh, for me, again, I'm somebody who will always put here a card that says do a sort of structure the industry survey and Gallup is one of the items here. I never put it as do the Gallup survey because maybe it's not the one that needs, but follow up on the engagement and improve it from time to time. It's, in my opinion, something that will be here. So, um one word, and then we wrap it up with questions. What other areas need structure? Well, everything, uh, people, team, uh, if you work in software development, security, infrastructure, uh, engineering practices, if you work uh, in recruitment, uh, I don't know, your recruitment funnel, uh, everything can have this kind of work. You can look at what structure do I need to create to win? on everything that's important to you. I do suggest you don't start with processes, as I said. Don't ask yourself, what are the rules to make my Scrum work? But rather ask yourself, what are the rules to make my team work? What are the rules to make my company work? What are the rules to uh, do um, something that's directly connected to the business? So that's it. That was the talk. Um, I will not speak too much about how this works, but it works, proven, uh, 
I can tell you about that uh, directly on LinkedIn. Um, I want to thank you all for the energy, for the participation, for your questions. And I'm still here for uh, at least 15 minutes um, if you have questions. For sure, I recall that Mihaela had three. So Mihaela, yes. I think you have the floor for the questions. Yeah, thank you. And I now I think I have tried to distill it to only one. So which is like I hope it's going to be really interesting. I'm really waiting for your answer, Gandre. So maybe you can tell us a little bit what were the most unexpected rules that the teams or the organizations that you've worked with came up with. I I can't think of anything. Um, no, nothing out of the ordinary. Sometimes the kind of stuff like that card, no toxic behavior, um, is not one that in a sense surprises, but I mean, gives you a hint what's important for certain contexts. And it it might, in that sense, surprise me by, by understanding a little bit of where I am or where that company is and what would be important to, to focus on. Um, from that sense, I would say that those kind of things surprise me. But then nothing, I can't think now of something out of the ordinary. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stefan also raised the hand earlier a little bit. Stefan, you still have a question for Andre? Yeah, I was uh, I was the one that uh, mentioned Q12. Uh, I think uh, before uh, making any change, implementing uh, practice, you should measure. So I think it's important to always have some metrics relevant ones and Q12 I think it's uh, it correlates well with uh, the engagement I'm curious whether you used it before I did and I like it I like it a lot I think it's very powerful um, nice. and I usually see items in that efficiency column waste and efficiency that says start measuring engagement and trend towards a better engagement and like really trend, not just fake trend towards a better engagement. I can also add on this. I worked at a company which implemented uh, basically the Gallup questionnaire and I can say that with the good follow-up on it, it can be very effective. So meaning actually somebody analyzing, let's say the answers, making an average and actually coming to the team and asking about uh, why is this uh, ranked at this point and actually trying to solve if there's something to solve for that team. Thank you. Andre, I have a question for you related to the structure needed for increased customer satisfaction. What do it will be for you the I don't know top three things that the company should look should look should look for? I think that's a super interesting question. And a lot of time I looked at do you have do you need a maturity model for that? Or through all of your maturity models and your structure, you want to go on a certain level. And that will automatically bring you better customer satisfaction and i lean more towards that that you should identify all the dimensions that are important for you the dimensions that are really close to producing value and i always suggest starting with people starting with teams starting with the dynamics between teams looking on all of those things and creating this kind of maturity models and journeys and saying if we do want to be there on the top of the, let's say, employee and customer satisfaction, let's just try to aim to bring all this higher than the, I mean, at least having the two columns for all of these dimensions that are important for me. So I think that's one of the tricky things is that not everything deserves a maturity model in a sense. Not all questions deserve a maturity model, but some of them emerges as 
as things are more mature in a in a sense. So here I lean towards more that than saying history thing. Thank you. Really cool. Uh, and if you allow me another one, because just pop up to my mind. So you are seeing this journey, uh, something similar like uh, Tugman stages of the teams, like you don't have like a growth all the time, but you are going like this in general. So you can have ups and downs. It is something similar in this kind of journey from your experience or? Um, yeah, one thing that first, I think these tools really speak to executives. When they see them, they say, wow, I like it. I really like them. I want to put them that in place uh, because they do see it as a, as a wonderful tool for visibility. And um, a lot of times they have, they have the question, why are we so slow? Why do, does it feel like my company is wasting so much energy? And then we create some of these maturity models and you, we say, you see the column waste and efficiency. <laughs> you see like nothing is checked here. So that that kind of matches what you say, that it feels like things are wasteful because all of these rules that will make your context non-wasteful, they you don't have them in place. So it's normal to not to, to not be wasteful. And what I see in these maturity models is that people will start using them they will be maybe feeling them a little bit too simplistically saying there is a line there that says we study people engagement and we are trending towards better engagement every three months and then they just have a short questionnaire sent by email they don't really know if people answer they don't really know if people answer rightfully they never do something to change it. It just, I don't know, maybe put in place a Christmas party or something like that, hoping for things to change. And they say, oh, that's checked. But actually, if you really look at it, no, that's not checked because that's a lot of work to do there. It's not, not just a simple line. It's like something that has a lot of acceptance criteria in a sense, in which you should be proving that that's, that's there. And I see a lot of time that. Uh, we go and we feel a lot of stuff. And then when we scrutinize it a little bit, we say, ah, this is actually not done. And this is not done. And this is not done. And this is not done. And then we say, if we really want to make this work, we should take it seriously, uh, in a sense. So that's kind of like what I thought of while, while you said the Tuckman journey for team formation. Where we Thank go. you so much. Thank you, Andre. We have time for one more question. Egor has raised the hand. So please, Egor. Uh, yeah, so I also think about uh, maturity assessment model, uh, how we, it is linked with this maturity model. And uh, also, uh, should we think about not only product ownership level, but uh, on a team level or on an organizational level? So what could you uh, share on this? There are there are many assessment models for maturity um, and they can help. They can be a good start. But my recommendation is never take somebody else's maturity model and just install it in your company because it won't, in a sense, take account of your context. You're just, just copy-pasting something. This is actually the problem, the big problem with CMMI is that Company were, companies, a lot of companies were saying, we do that, we do that, we do that, we do that, we do that. Uh, but that didn't help them in a sense. It just became a, a way to, to, to say that there are some certification, but a lot of, let's say, a lot of dirt was hidden under the, the rug, so to say. But other maturity models are interesting to, to inspire you in a sense. But what I was trying to say here is that if you understand that you can build a simple maturity models with these three columns and you will start saying, what's important for me? People, teams, security, infrastructure, I don't know, onboarding processes. And you start listing the, the things that are important for you and you put them with your teams, with your companies in these three simple columns. And you say, where are we now? And where do we want to be? Because every item there requires energy and some of them a lot of energy 
I think that's the right way to proceed. So understanding like the framework to create the structure and create your own structure rather than saying, I'm going to take it from somebody else and I'm going to apply it in my context. Um, that That's my my biggest advice here. And this is such a simple tool, but it's, in my opinion, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Uh, Adrian, you want to say something? Or Okay. So, conscious of time, uh, we need to close for today. But uh, if you have some questions, uh, Andre said he is available via LinkedIn. You can you can reach to him, connect with him, probably have uh, uh, more discussions about the topics. Uh, thank you so much, Andre, for this uh, very insightful uh, discussion and pre pre presentation. Um, also, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Next month, we have another special guest, uh, Ciprian Bonica, uh, and uh, we'll have a talk about flow metrics. Uh, Ciprian, it's a, uh, it's a, a, a scrum trainer, agile trainer, and uh, agile practitioner. Um, and uh, 18th of July is the date, so one month from now, uh, we'll uh, send an update via the meetup and uh, hope to see you there. Thank you again, and have a very nice evening. Thank, thank you very much, Andre, and thank yeah. you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.